Let's read together, please, in the book of Genesis, and we're in chapter 7. Genesis chapter 7. I'm going to begin to read in verse 1 of that chapter. Praise God. Genesis chapter 7, and we're beginning to read in verse 1. And the Lord said unto Noah, Come thou and all thy house into the ark, for thee have I seen righteous before me in this generation. Of every clean beast, Thou shalt take to thee by sevens the male and his female, and the beasts that are not clean by two the male and his female. Of fowls also of the air by sevens the male and the female, to keep seed alive upon the face of all the earth. For yet seven days, and I will cause it to rain upon the earth forty days and forty nights. And every living substance that I have made will I destroy from off the face of the earth. And Noah did unto all that the Lord commanded him. And Noah was 600 years old when the flood of water was upon the earth. And Noah went in and his sons and his wife and his sons' wives with him into the ark because of the waters of the flood. Just those seven verses And as always, we just want to thank God for his word this evening, and we just ask and trust for his blessing to rest upon it. Friends, this evening what I want to do is just very, very simply focus our thoughts upon really one word that we find in the verses that lie before us in the scripture this evening. And it's simply what we read there in verse 1 of that chapter where we were reading together. And the Lord said unto Noah, and here's the word, come, come. Very, very simple word, and yet it has or carries with it a tremendous, a profound truth whenever you think of the, first of all, of the context of which it was spoken. Let me, let me just speak for that, for about that for a moment or two. We know the story of the flood, of course, and we know that God had, had told Noah what would happen. In the previous chapter, in chapter 6 and verse 8, it says that Noah found grace in the sight of God. There was something that God was doing in Noah's heart. There was something that God was doing in his life. He found grace in the eyes of the Lord, and God began to reveal to him what he was about to do. The Bible tells us that God repented that he had ever made mankind Sin on the world and the world, sin on the earth, had become so rampant, had become so hideous. All kinds of things were happening. And God decided, as we read in this verse, God said he was going to wipe out all the substance that he had made upon the face of the earth. It was going to be wiped out in a flood. And Noah and his wife and his sons and their wives would be saved. And so God says to him, you've got to build an ark. You've got to provide something. I want you to build an ark. I want you to bring in the animals, the birds, the various things, and you will survive the judgment that's coming upon the world for sin. Now, if you know anything about your Bible this evening, let me say this to you, that the ark, whilst it was something which is historic, and in fact, it's interesting because no matter what religion in the world you go to, There's a story of a flood, a worldwide flood. There are people today who says to us, that could never have happened. And yet in every single religion of the world, it carries the truth of this story of a worldwide flood which did take place. And there are other evidences, of course, uh, whenever you come to some of the sediments and the way the rocks are laid down and the various layers and some of the fossils and some of the various things that have been found in different layers of rock, it's evident that they were trapped there in an instant. And the only way that that can really be explained is because of the the huge volume of water and mud and all of the other stuff that was moving along on the face of the globe at that time. There were animals. Do you know there were animals who were actually captured in places they have been discovered and they're in the rocks as fossils, some of them giving birth to their young? In other words, something tremendous had happened in an instant. And there, were, there was one area up in northern Europe 
where they found a number of what they could only explain as, as you know, the huge, as it mammoths you call them, the huge elephants and so on. And there was a, a whole number of them in one particular area that they discovered that they unearthed. And the only reasonable explanation was that they were obviously fleeing in front of something that was, was coming behind them. And they came to an area where they couldn't rise like a canyon, where they couldn't rise up to get away from it. And in a moment or two, they were simply buried in whatever happened. And they uncovered. There's all sorts of things all over the world that have been unearthed by archaeologists to prove Indeed, that the flood did take place. So in spite of what people say today, the word of God, the Bible says, let God be true and let every man be a liar. And so God tells Moses about this flood. Or sorry, God tells Noah about this flood. He tells him to make an ark. And he says, through the making of that ark, he will, God will preserve something to come out at the end of the judgment. And as I've said, if you know anything about your Bible, you will realize that the ark, whilst historical in the Old Testament, the ark speaks very, very boldly, very plainly about the work of our Lord Jesus Christ. We live today at a time in the world when sin once again is very rampant. There are all kinds of things. You don't need me to stand in this pulpit this evening to remind you of some of the things that we see on the news some of the terrible things that are happening in our streets, some of the things, you know, all over the world tonight, there are all kinds of sin. And you know, I look at that, and I think of the words of our Lord Jesus Christ. <clears throat> and he said that as it was in the days of Noah, so it would be when the Son of Man would come. Friends, we're living undoubtedly in the last days of time. We're living right at the end of that period, just before the appearance of our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. And tonight I want to make it very, very plain, right at the beginning of this message, that if you're here tonight and you're still in sin, sin will be judged. The judgment of God will be unleashed upon sin. And the only safe place to be this evening is in the ark of God's provision. You see, the ark in this story was God's provision. The ark was God's remedy. The ark was God's place of refuge as far as the judgment upon sin would be concerned. And this evening, all these years later, the only safe place to be again is in God's provision, the Lord Jesus Christ. And tonight, he is the ark of refuge. He is the place of safety from the judgment that will come upon this word. And so tonight, if you're in this service and you're still in sin, we would want to encourage you tonight to look to the Lord Jesus Christ. We would want to encourage you tonight to look at the provision that God has made in his love for your soul and for your salvation, that you might escape that great judgment, that you might be found safe in the ark which is our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. But we're focusing our thoughts upon this word, come. The ark has been built in Noah's day. The time has, is ready. God is about to unleash his judgment upon the world. <clears throat> Excuse me. And he says to Noah, come. I want to suggest to you, first of all, that God didn't say to him, go. So many people think as far as the safety of, of eternity is concerned and the salvation of God is concerned, so many people think that they need to go and do something. But here in this story, we find God doesn't say go. God says, come. And I think that's tremendous because it means to me that God was in the ark. You understand what I'm trying to say here? The ark has been prepared it is God's refuge. It is God's provision for the judgment which is about to come. And God himself, there's something of the presence of God himself in that ark that's waiting for Noah and his family and all of the creatures that they bring with them to come in, to abide in his presence, to be with him through this time of tremendous judgment upon the world. 
You see, this was God's appointed way of salvation. And he says, come, come. It wasn't just a place of refuge. But can I say also this evening, it was a place of separation. Separation. You see, friends, saved ones are always set apart for God. And so he calls them into himself that they might be separated from the judgment which is about to fall in the world all around them. You know, Noah had, had built this ark 120 years, it tells us, in the New Testament to, to build it, to get it to this moment in time. And he had told the people it would rain. The people wouldn't believe him. And the reason they wouldn't believe him was because there never had been rain in the world before. The Bible tells us that the herbs and so on, they were watered from a dew that rose up through the ground where they were living in a completely different environment. And whenever Noah began to build his ark, they said to him, what are you building it here for? In the middle of nowhere, so to speak. He says, it's going to rain. How? What are you talking about? Nothing like that has ever happened in the world before. And friends, it's exactly the same tonight. We see Jesus Christ is coming again. And people say, what are you talking about? He was crucified. He was dead. Do you really believe he rose from the, from the dead? And you see, people today do not believe because we talk about something that this world has never seen before. The Bible says Jesus shall come. The Bible says every eye shall see him. The Bible says that Jesus will bring with him the spirits and the souls of people who have gone on before. The Bible says that resurrection will take place. The dead in Christ shall rise. Those who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with the Lord to meet the, with them to meet the Lord in the air. And the Bible says, so shall we ever be with the Lord. Can you believe that tonight? Because the word says no. The word says, how could that possibly happen? It has never, ever, ever happened in the world before. You see, friends, we're like that. Because we have never seen a certain thing, or because in this world the world has never experienced a certain thing, we are very reluctant, we are very slow to believe that such miraculous things could happen. But Moses, or sorry, I'm back in Moses again. Noah declared rain, and the rain came. And tonight the church declares that Jesus Christ will come again. Our Lord Jesus Christ himself declared that he would come again. And the word of God declares that he would come again. And friends, whether we believe it or whether we don't, I tell you tonight, praise God, he will come again. He will come again. And just as the rain was coming, when Jesus comes again, he separates those that are his from those that aren't. Those that are his go to be with him and his blessing. Those who aren't, they face the judgment of Almighty God unleashed upon a world where all kinds of sin is taking place. And the sad thing about it is that whenever Jesus comes, there will be people who will be left to face that judgment. And they will be there in spite of the fact of this word that we're focusing upon tonight where Jesus has said, come. He says, come. I want to ask you tonight, have you ever obeyed that voice? Have you ever obeyed that word? Come. You see, the message of Christ is very clear, very simple. First of all, Jesus says, come unto me. He says, I will give you rest. I want to ask you this evening, have you got rest in your soul? As you look towards eternity, as you look towards the end of your life's journey, are you at peace tonight? Is there a rest in your soul? Or tell me, are you anxious? If that moment should catch up with you this evening, would there be an anxiety in your heart? Because you're uncertain about eternity and you're uncertain about the future. Here's the answer for that uncertainty. Jesus says, come on to me. And he says, I will give you rest. It's a call into his rest. 
You rest from your own labors. You rest from your own struggles. You rest from trying to do the things that you feel you need to do in order to be good enough to have eternal life and you never be good enough. You never could do enough. The Bible says that all of our righteousness is just like filthy rags in the sight of God. And Jesus says, look, lay that aside. He says, come to me. I can give you rest from all of that labor. I can give you an assurance within your heart. I can give you an assurance deep down within your soul. You will be at rest. And tonight, praise God, he can do that because he has borne it all upon the cross of Calvary, paying with his blood, laying down his life so that your soul in him could find refuge because he is God's provision for your soul. And so he says, come on to me. I will give you rest. Let me give you another one. In John chapter 1, verse 39, we're not going to read the verse. We're not even going to tell the story. But Jesus told two of the disciples, he said to them, come and see. In other words, Jesus doesn't just give rest tonight. Jesus gives knowledge. Come and see. Whenever you come to the Lord Jesus Christ, you are unable to see the things that he wants you to see. You're unable to know the things that he would desire you to know. Let me give you another one. In John 7, verse 37, Jesus cried out on that occasion, If any man thirst, let him come unto me, and drink. I call that the come of satisfaction. If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. There's a story in John chapter 4 where Jesus met the woman at the well, a sinful woman. And he says to her, give me some water. And as she's drawing the water, she looks at him and she says, you being a Jew, you ask a Samaritan for water. He said, if only you knew who you were speaking to. He said, you would ask of me and I would give you living water. And he said, anyone who drinks the living water which I give them, they'll never thirst again. Friends, Jesus places something within the life that completely satisfies. He says, if any man thirst, let him come unto me and let him drink. Complete satisfaction in the Lord Jesus Christ. In Mark's gospel chapter 10, I'm just running a few of these past. In Mark's gospel chapter 10 and verse 21, Jesus told the rich young ruler in that story to go and sell all that he had and give it to the poor. And he says, come take up your cross and follow me. There he's speaking about coming into relationship with him. Coming to him, being taught by him, being discipled by him, walking with him and being sent forth by him. In Joshua chapter 10, let me give you another one. It says, Joshua called all the men of Israel and said, come near. And he said, put your feet upon the necks of these kings. God had given them victory in that situation. And they are called to put, to put their feet upon the necks of those kings. You see, Jesus tonight, praise God, there's a come and he says, come to me, there's victory. Victory in the heart. Victory over sin. Victory in life, to reign. The Bible says we reign with Christ in life. You can know victory within your heart tonight over sin and over despair. And these are just a few of the word come that we see throughout the pages of Scripture. In John chapter 21, Jesus said to them, come and dine. If you know that story, they have gone back to their fishing. And Jesus is waiting there upon the shore and they realize it's him and they leave the vessel and they make their way towards the shore and he has a fire made and there's fish upon the fire. He says, come and dine. He's speaking of fellowship. God calls us onto himself. He says, come. And he brings us into sweet fellowship with him. We can commune with him. We can talk with him. He can talk with us. And praise God, we can know that communion of fellowship with Almighty God. In Mark's gospel, chapter 6, Jesus said to his disciples, Come ye yourselves apart into a desert place and rest a while. There we find refreshment for the soul. Just to be alone with the Lord Jesus Christ. To be away from the, the hustle and bustle of everyday life. 
to be in a place of, 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 of solitude with him. There's refreshment for the soul and for the life. You see, friends, the reason I'm giving these tonight is because these are all things that we all need. We all need. We need that rest for our soul. We need that knowledge that God wants us to have in life. We need something to satisfy the craving, the longing that's deep within us. We can have discipleship whereby we can be taught of him and walk with him and be sent by him. We can know victory in our life over the enemy, over temptation and over sin. We can know fellowship with God, the highest being in the entire universe, and yet he fellowships with us. We can know refreshment. Whenever there's difficulty in life, whenever there's problems, whenever the stress and the pressure is there. And then let me give you this one, Matthew 25. Then shall the king say unto them on his right hand, Come ye blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the word. Here we are told to come into our inheritance into our inheritance. Let me read that to you again. Come ye blessed of my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you. Do you get that tonight? Inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the word. Dear one, do you realize tonight that God has a kingdom prepared for you? Prepared for those who love him prepared from the foundation of the word. He has an inheritance waiting for you to step into, waiting for you to claim. And you see, God says to Noah in this story, come, come Noah, come into the provision. Come into what I have provided in order to go through the judgment that is coming upon the word. And tonight as we look to the cross of Calvary, God says to every single one of us in this place, come. Come into this great salvation. Come into God's provision. Because our salvation embraces all of these things if you will respond to him and if you will come to the Lord Jesus Christ through the cross of Calvary. How must we come? Friends, the answer to that is very, very simple. How must we come? Listen, we come just as we are. We don't try to clean our acts up. We don't try to look presentable. No, we come just in our sin. We come to him as we are, confessing what we are and trusting him as God's provision, ample provision, a place of refuge and a place of safety. We trust him and we give our hearts, we give our lives, we give our all to him. You see, there's nothing we can do about salvation for ourselves. Someone has said we're too far gone already and how true that is. We're sinners by nature, sinners by deed, sinners by word. And thank God tonight, because we are sinners, Christ died for us upon the cross of Calvary. He can make us new creation, new creatures in himself. And so we, how do we come? We come just as we are. But you know, there are many ways that people respond, as I've already said. Some will say to us today, there was no flood. Some will say to us today, Jesus Christ will never, ever return again. But God continually extends his invitation. He says, come, come in, come thou, come unto me. And some look at it. Some look at it, at that invitation. Some look at the cross. Some look at what the Bible has to say about the end times in which we are living. And some look at it, and their interest really only constrains them to take a passing glance at this great provision. Can I ask you tonight, how do you look at the cross? Is it just a, a passing glance? Or have you ever really taken the time to consider that the cross, my friend, was about you? God's lovely son, dying in our place instead, dying so that you and me, so that we could be saved from our sin. Or have you just lived life, just taken a, 
a glancing, a passing glance at the cross of Calvary at Christ. There are others who know what the Bible has to say. They know about the cross. And their interest causes them to talk about it. Could it be that you're one of those people perhaps tonight, you don't know the Lord, but there are times when you talk about the cross. You talk about it. And you see your curiosity is awakened. You look at the cross. You maybe even believe what the Bible says about the Lord Jesus Christ. But you've never gone any further than simply to talk about it. Then there are others who look at the cross of Calvary, look at the things that we're talking about tonight, and they, they sneer at it. They sneer. And they will even laugh at those who would accept it. I am quite sure in this building tonight there's no one who's like that because you wouldn't be here if you were like that. But can I say this to you tonight? Maybe the reason you don't take that step is because others will sneer at you. Don't allow that to put you off tonight. Don't allow that to put you off. Some look at it. Some talk about it. Some simply sneer at it. But here's the thing. Whether they believed in this story or whether they did not believe in this story, God called Noah in. And Noah obeyed that call. And Noah went in, and the Bible goes on to tell us with every living creature that he was told to take in with his family. And the Bible tells us that everything else in the world experienced that judgment that Noah had talked about. And I'm asking you tonight, just as we close, have you heard God's call come to your heart? Have you obeyed that call? As God perhaps in times past has said to you, look, will you not come to Christ? Will you not come to the cross? God has said to you, will you not come on to me that you might receive eternal life? See, the Bible tells us that the wages of sin is death. Death was about to, to be passed upon every living creature in the world at that time. And the Bible says the wages of sin is death. But thank God tonight that verse says, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. I'm asking you tonight, have you come to Christ? Have you come through the cross of Calvary? How must we come? I've already said, you come very simply, just as you are. You come in your sin. You come in humility. And you acknowledge that sin before God. And thank God as Noah found grace, the Bible says, by grace are you saved through faith. And that not of yourselves, it's a gift of God. Not of works, lest any man should boast. God has a gift of eternal life just for you. And if you will come to Christ, you will find the grace of God will bestow that gift upon your life. How must we come? We come just as we are. Let me say this in closing. When must we come? When must we come? God said to Noah, come thou and thy family into the ark. We didn't take time to read it tonight. But as soon as they had obeyed the call of God, and as soon as the animals had been gathered in and the fowls, and they had gone on, listen, the Bible says, God shut the door. There was only one door. And God shut that door the moment that he had gathered in those that had found grace in his sight. And so we finish with that thought, when must we come? One hour before you die? Is that possible? And you see, connected to that question is the thought, well, when will that be? When will that be? Will that be next week, perhaps? Will that be next month, perhaps? Will that be next year? When will you come? When will you die? The Bible says, come now. The Bible says, today, if you hear his voice, harden not your heart. The Bible says, behold, now is the accepted time. As the invitation of God comes to your heart this evening in this simple service, 
and he's tugging at your heartstring now, and you hear his voice, you hear Christ speaking to you, and he's saying, come, come to me. He's saying to you, there is provision in me for all of your needs, that satisfaction that we thought about, all of those different things that we highlighted, connected with the word come. And tonight you hear his voice. He's tugging at your heart. You sense that tug. And he's saying, come. The Bible says, behold, now is the accepted time. This is the day of salvation. You see, friends, thank God tonight we have the privilege of another gospel service. Can I say this to you tonight? We might never, listen to me, we might never ever have another gospel service here again. Have you ever stopped to think about that? Jesus could come. Or God could call you out into eternity. And you might never sit in a service like this again under the invitation of God to come to Christ. And you see now, that's why it's so important. Now is the accepted time. And thank God that door is still open. Because Jesus, he says, I am the door. By me, if any man shall enter in, he shall be saved and go in and go out and shall find pasture. And so the call comes to us. God says, come. God was in the ark. He was waiting for Noah to respond. And through Christ, the invitation says, come. And the Bible says, God was in Christ, reconciling the word unto himself. And tonight he bids you to come unto him. Put your faith, put your trust in this wonderful Savior who is God's provision who can meet every single need concerning your life and concerning your soul. And praise God, he can cause you to rise in him, the ark of life. He can cause you to rise above the judgment that will be passed upon this world in these closing days of time because of sin. But dear one, it's up to you. Will you come tonight? Do you hear his voice? Will you come? Will you come and come to Jesus even now? Let's just bow in prayer, please. Praise God. Praise God. <coughs> Friends, it's just a simple gospel message. Because the gospel isn't complicated in any way. Jesus came into this world to pay for our sin. And to those who come to him, praise God, they receive that payment which he has made, sins paid in full. The grace of God and the gift of God, which is eternal life. Will you come to him now? Just in these moments. And all you've got to do is lift your heart. Lift your heart to him now and say, Lord, I'm a sinner. And Lord, I can do nothing for myself, but I thank you that you did it all for me at the cross of Calvary. Lord, forgive me. Lord, save me. Lord, I'm asking you to be my Savior. And I thank you for your love and for the blood that you shed to wash away my sin. All you've got to do is reach out to him like that. Call upon him while he's near. Accept his invitation to come and you can leave this house tonight saved by the grace of God, washed in his precious blood with the assurance in your heart that eternal life is yours because Jesus is the ark of God and you've come in at God's invitation. Will you do that now? Just going to wait for a moment or two as I always do. You respond to him now. Just in these moments.
And Father, tonight, Lord, we just give you thanks. We just give you praise for this gospel message. Lord, it's old, and yet, praise God, it's ever new. We pray, Lord, that the truth of this message tonight might strike a chord in some hearts in this place. You know us each one tonight. Holy Spirit, move upon our lives and upon our hearts now, we pray. For any, perhaps, who know thee not, we ask it right in these moments of time. They will hear your voice and they will respond to that call and they will come to salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ. To that end, Lord, bless your word now to every life. Move upon us all by the power of your spirit. And Lord, save such as should be saved. In Jesus' holy name we pray. Amen. Amen.